What color is your function? I don't know about you, but nothing gets me going in the morning like a good old-fashioned programming language rant. Okay, 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 okay. Guess who just turned off alerts? This guy. Press the like button. Uh, <laughs> it stirs the blood to see someone skewer one of those blub languages. The hell's a blub language? Okay, I don't want to. I don't want to find out what a blub language is. I can't do that. I can't do that. Uh, the plebeians use muddling through their day with it between uh, furtive visits to Stack Overflow. I think that's a reference to JavaScript. JavaScript. I love it. Meanwhile, you and I only use the most enlightened of languages: Sizzle Sharp. <laughs> Chisel Sharp. Tools designed for manicured hands of expert craftspersons, uh, such as ourselves. Okay, that's pretty funny. Uh, of course, as the author of said uh, uh, screed, I run a risk. The language I mock could be the one you like. Without realizing it, I could have let the rabble into my blog, pitchforks and torches at the ready, and my foolhardy pamphlet could draw their ire. It's true. I'm going to cut the music because one time I ruined a recording because of it. To protect myself from the heat of those flames and to avoid offending your possible delicate sensibilities, instead, I'll rant about the language I just made up. A straw man whose sole purpose is to set a flame. Okay, okay, okay. I know, this seems pointless, right? Trust me. By the end, you'll see whose face or faces have been painted on this straw noggin. Okay, I'm kind of curious. Now now you got you got me tickled, okay? You got me tickled. Learning an entire new crappy language just for a blog is a tall order. So let's say most let's see. Let's just say it's mostly similar to the one you and I already know. We'll say it has syntax sort of like JS, curly braces and semicolons, if, wiles, etc. The the lingua franca of the programming grotto. Uh, I'm picking up JS not because that's what the post is about. It's just that it's the language you statistically representation of the average reader are most likely to be able to grok viola. <laughs> This is a beautiful, by the way, this is a beautiful sentence, okay? If, if you don't love this, if you aren't in love with what you just read, you're crazy, okay? Uh, not in love with your color scheme. Uh, what, what is this? What is that? What is, what is this? Is this because I'm using dark readers? Am I screwing up your color here? Hold on. Oh, goodness. Uh, we're going to keep it like this. Uh, just because our, let's see, because our straw man is a modern shitty language. <laughs> we also have first class functions. So you can make something like this. Uh, filter. Nice, nice kerning, bro. Hey, bro. Nice kerning. Uh, why, why is this so effed up, but this isn't? What happened there? What happened to this filter? Anyways, filter, blah, 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 blah. Nobody cares. This is one of those higher order functions. And like the name implies, they are classy, uh, as all get out and super useful. You're probably used to, uh, used to them for mucking around with collections. But once you internalize the concept, you start using them damn near everywhere. Is this a higher order function? I don't think this is a higher order function, right? Isn't a higher order function a function that returns a function? Or am I completely wrong on that? Isn't this just a function that uses functions? Like this itself isn't a higher order? Wouldn't you actually have something called filter that you pass in a predicate to and then returns a function that you can pass any collection to? So if you use a function, you're a higher order function. I think you guys are wrong. You're thinking of curring. Yes, curring creates higher order functions. Am I just higher order dummy? Okay, whatever. I'm too stupid to understand this. Uh, is a, let's see. Okay, okay. Okay, hold on. Before we continue on, let's just settle the debate. Let's just settle the debate. Okay, we're going to just settle the debate right here, right now. Uh, new poll. Higher order function. Simply has to take in function. Must return function. Okay, so I was 50% right, which means that I'm 100% wrong. Okay, cool. Cool. Hey, cool. This is one of those higher order functions, and like the name implies, they are classy as all get out and super useful. You're probably used to uh, to them for mucking around with collections, but once you internalize the concepts, start using them damn near everywhere. By the way, this is like the bane of my existence. When you're debugging code where people are just like, I use functions for everything. Dude, sometimes the debugging can be such a pain in the ass. It can be very ass painy. 
I, I know you functional bros out there are just like, curring is, for, you, curring is the Lord's language. Well, I'm not as smart as you. It feels hard sometimes when you have a function that's curried taking in functions that are also curried and you're trying to figure out who is the one that done f up, okay? It's hard. Sometimes it's hard for us small brains, okay? Us small, tiny brains find that very hard, okay? A funk, 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 funk is a hard function to understand. Uh, let's see, maybe in your testing framework, an apple, it ain't no orange, apple not to be an orange, facts. Or when you need to parse some data, uh, tokens match, token left bracket, consume, token right bracket, hell yeah. Uh, so to go, let's see, so so you go to town and write all sorts of awesome reusable libraries and applications, passing around functions, calling functions, returning functions, functapalooza. Absolutely, this was Netflix app at one point. What color is your function? Except, wait, here's where our language gets screwy. It has this one peculiar feature. Every function has a color. Each function, anonymous callback, or regular named one is either red or blue instead of a single function keyword. There are two, blue function, red function. This is a blue function, this is a red function. There are no colorless functions in the language. Want to make a function? Gotta pick a color. Them's the rules. And actually, there are a couple more rules you have to follow too. The way you can call a function depends on its color. Imagine blue call syntax and a red call syntax something like this okay so i i think we can i think we can clearly see where this is going blue being one of these being synchronous and one being async right i, I think I, I believe i've heard this before i've again i've never really read into this so it just feels exciting when calling a function you need to, you need to use the call that corresponds to the color uh if you get it wrong call a red function with a blue after the parenthesis, parenthesis or vice versa, it does something bad. Dredge up some long forgotten nightmare from your childhood like a clown with the snakes for arms hiding under your bed. That jumps out of your monitor and sucks a, uh, out your, I don't, vitreous, 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 vitreous humor. I, I've never heard this term used in this way. Is this a version of vitriol, but used as an adjective? Like a let's see, like glass in appearance or physical properties, substance derived from something containing glass. I don't get that. Your see-through humor. I don't get it. An annoying rule, right? Oh, and one more thing: you can only call a red function from within another red function. You can call a blue function from within a red one. That is kosher. Okay, but you can't go the other way around. If you try to do this, you're gonna get a visit from the old spider mouth uh, from Night Clown. <laughs> Good old class. Good old classic spider mouth. Uh, this makes writing higher order functions like our filter example trickier. We have to pick a color for it, and that affects the colors of the functions we're allowed to pass it in or pass to it. The obvious solution is to make filter red. That way, it can take either red or blue functions and call them. But then we run into the next itchy spot uh, in the hair hair shirt that is this language. The hair shirt. Okay, I also don't know this term. Can someone explain to me what a hair shirt is? What a boring blog post. This is an incredible blog post. This is a great, great blog post. Uh, red functions are more painful to call. For now, I won't precisely define painful, but just imagine that programmers have to jump through some kind of annoying hoops every time they call a red function. Maybe it's really verbose, or maybe you can't do it inside certain kinds of statements. Maybe you can only call them on uh, line numbers that are prime. Uh, for those, let's see. A hair shirt is a bandana slash do-rag? What? I've never heard that term. Uh, what matters is that you decide to make a function red. Everyone using your API will want to spit in your coffee or deposit some even less savory fluids in it. Uh-oh. Vitreous humor is the fluid in your eye. Oh, okay. Alas, a sadistic language designers. And we all know programming language designers are sadists, don't we? Jabbed one final thorn in our side. Five, some core library functions are red. There are some functions built into the platform, functions that we need to use that we are unable to write ourselves that only come in red. At this point, a reasonable person might think the language hates us. <laughs> That's actually pretty funny. It's functional programming's fault. You might be thinking that the problem here is that we're trying to use higher order functions. It just stops flouncing, flouncing around in all of that functional flippery and write normal blue collar first order functions like God intended. We'd spare ourselves all the headaches. 
Well, I mean, in some sense, if you can if you can thread, you can do this, right? If you can run your own threads, you can just always always blue, right? You can just always blue the son of a bitch, and we can call it a day. Uh, if only, uh, let's see, if we only call blue functions, make our uh, function blue. Otherwise, it, make it red. As long as we never make functions that accept functions, we don't have to worry about trying to be polymorphic over function color, polychromatic, uh, or any nonsense like that. But alas, higher order functions are just one example. This problem is uh, pervasive. Uh, anytime we want to break our program down into separate functions to get reused. So for those that, like, I know, I, I I like this, okay? Because this, you know, I've never really been one to formalize a lot of my, I just blew myself. I, I've never been someone to formalize how I feel about things. Uh, I just have, like, these roadmaps in my head about when do I make a function async or not. And I always have this just, just, I just hate it because once I do it, it spreads like, you know, it spreads everywhere. And obviously this, I, I assume this is just simply an explanation of async and that's all it is. It's just like, man, there's times where you want to create something that's synchronous and then it has to be asynchronous. And then it's just the worst because it gets stuck in these weird constructs of the language, you know, and it just, it just makes it so annoying sometimes. For example, let's say we have a little nice blob of code that, I don't know, implements Dijkstra's algorithm over a graph representing how much your social network are crushing on each other. I spent way too long trying to decide what result would even represent transitive undesirability. <laughs> what? Uh, what? Later, you end up needing to use this same blob of code somewhere else. You do the natural thing and hoist it into a separate function. You call it from the old place and your new code it, uh, that uses it. But what color should it be? Obviously, you'll make it blue if you can. But what if it uses some of those nasty read-only core libraries? Uh, well, what if the new place you want to call it is blue? You'll have to turn it red. Then you'll have to turn the function that calls it red. Ugh. No matter what, you'll... You'll have to think about some color constantly. It will be the sand in your swimsuit on the beach vacation of development. It's a fact. Of course, I I mean, this is another reason. I mean, really what this is, is speaking about, like, if you just drop the idea of what color is your function, the thing, the thing that's really hard, and this is one thing that I find annoying about Rust, is that when you have a value that you have to lift, it kind of starts spreading that value. So like error handling. Once you have a function that needs error handling, you have to lift the value or you use syntax and it just keeps on it keeps on going this thing. And I can find it I I, I can definitely understand why people find it annoying cuz or else you have to start doing this like if else business and it doesn't quite work that well, especially with the borrow checker it just makes it a huge pain in the ass. Uh yeah. it can be very frustrating. Like I totally get this even beyond just async await, right? Um, it's just like observables. Observables do the exact same thing. It's an extremely, extremely leaky interface that once you start using them, it just goes everywhere. And you can't help it because one function that has it, the rest of the functions must have it. Of course, I'm not really talking about color here, am I? It's just an allegory, a literary trick. The, sn the sneeches isn't about the stars on the bellies. I don't even get that. Uh, wait, What? It's about race. What the hell are we talking about? By now, you have an inkling of what color actually represents. If not here, here's the big reveal. Red functions are asynchronous ones. If you're programming in JavaScript on Node.js, every time you define a function that returns a value by invoking a callback, you just made a red function. Look back at that list of rules and see how my metaphor stacks up. Synchronous function return values. Async ones do not. Instead, they invoke callbacks. Yep. Synchronous functions give their result as a return value. Async functions give it by a callback you pass in. This is before the time of standardized syntax of async await exact same thing is it it's a doctor who book okay well that i'm not a child i have i don't know okay i don't read doctor who because i'm not a baby okay and you know what i read to my kids wheel of time okay i don't read them doctor who or whatever it is doctor whatever it is doctor who book that's not right either what the hell is it dr seuss is it dr seuss you mean not doctor who dr seuss yeah okay i was about to say doctor who wait a second that's a completely different doctor Wheel of time. Hell yeah. Uh, you can't call an async function from a synchronous one because you won't be able to determine the results until the async one completes later. Correct. Async functions don't compose in expressions because of the callbacks, uh, have different error handling, and can't be used with try catch. Okay, well, some of this has changed, but also not incorrect, right? So you can't chain async functions still in JavaScript. You have to do the little, you have to go full lisp on it and be like, because they chose prefix uh, syntax. So it's like, await this thing, parentheses, to JSON, await that thing, get this value, like, duh, 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 right? Like, it just, it just grows. 
Uh, Node's whole stick is that the core libs are all asynchronous, though they dial that back by started adding sync. Yep, they did. When people talk about callback hell, they're talking about how annoying it is to have red functions in their language. When the when they create 4,089 libraries for doing asynchronous programming. <sighs> I don't think the author saw this one coming, okay? I don't think they saw that one coming where it was actually going to effectively 13x. Side in functions make you crazy? Yeah, I get that. I prefer my Sayadar functions. Uh, yeah. Should have, should have, should have saw that one coming. Should never put a language. You should have put the ever growing amount. I mean, he's very flowery with his language as it is. Should have made a creative ever growing. Uh, they're trying to cope at the library level with the problem that the language foisted upon them. Update. Nice, hey, nice comma. Hey, nice comma, bro. <laughs> I uh, I promise the future is better. Uh, people in Node community have realized that callbacks are a pain for a long time and have looked around for solutions. One technique that gets a bunch of people excited is promises, which you may also know by their wrapper name, Futures. Okay. Uh, these are sort of jacked up wrapper around callbacks and an error handler. If you think of passing a callback and error back to a function as a concept, a promise is basically a reification of that idea. It's a first class object that represents asynchronous operation. I jammed a bunch of fancy PL language, language in that paragraph, so it probably sounds like a sweet deal, but it's basically snake oil. Promises do make async code a little easier to write. They compose a bit better, so rule four isn't quite so onerous. But honestly, it's like the difference between being punched in the gut versus being punched in the privates. <laughs> that is such a good statement. Oh my goodness. I just love that. Technically less painful, yes. But I don't think anyone should get really thrilled about the value proposition. <laughs> Oh, this is, this literally might be my favorite statement ever read, like of all time. You can't still use them with the, ex let's see, you still can't use them with the exception handling or other control flow statements. Uh, you can now. Uh, you still can't call a function that returns a future from synchronous code. Well, you can, but if you do, the person uh, who later maintains your code will invent a time machine, travel back in time to the moment you did this and stab you in the face with a number two pencil. Yep. You still, uh, you're, you've still divided your entire world into asynchronous and synchronous halves and all the misery that entails. So even if your language features promises or futures, uh, its face looks an awful lot like one of those, uh, one of my straw men. Oh gosh, I couldn't read that thing. Its face looks an awful like, awful lot like one on my straw man. Okay, goodness gracious. Yes, even means Dart, the language I work on. That's why I'm so excited about the team are experimenting with other concurrency models. All right. I love JavaScript. Oh, you do? You love JavaScript too? Okay, cool. That's neat. Uh, C-sharp programmers are probably feeling pretty smug right now, a uh, condition they've increasingly fallen prey to as the Heisen, uh, the, the Hilsenberg. Is that what I don't even know how to say that word. Hils, Hil, Hil, Hilsenberg and company have uh, pilled sweet feature after sweet feature into the language. In C-sharp, you can use a wait keyword to invoke an asynchronous function. Yeah, let's. Uh, this lets you. This lets you make asynchronous calls just as easily as you can synchronous ones with a tiny addition of a cute little keyword. Uh, you can nest await calls and expressions. You can use them in exception handling code. Okay, so this is all done in JavaScript now, obviously. Stuff uh, stuff them into control flow. Go nuts. Make it rain await calls uh, like they are dollars in the advance you got for your new rap album. Async await is nice, which is why we're adding it to Dart. It makes it a lot easier to write asynchronous code, you know, uh, but is coming. Uh, it is, but you still have to divide the world in two. Those are async functions. Uh, those async functions are easier to write, but they're still async functions. You've got, uh, you still have got two colors. Async await solves an annoying rule for, uh, they make red functions not much worse to call than blue ones, but all of the other rules still apply. Synchronous functions return values. Yep. Uh, sync functions. Uh, let's see. Yep. Uh, you need to call an async function. You've got this wrapper object when you actually want T. Yep. Yep. Uh, aside from the liberal garnish of await, we did uh, we did fix this. C Sharp's core library is actually older than async, so I guess I'll never have this problem. Yep. 
I mean, this is all true. This is all very, very true. It is better. I will uh, I will take async await over a bear callbacks or futures any day of the week. Yep. But we're lying to ourselves if we think all of our troubles are gone. As soon as you start trying to write higher order functions and reuse code, you're right back to realizing color is still there, bleeding all over your code base. Yes, this is very true. As someone who has to do this, I, I really do hope... I'd, I like async iterators. Those are pretty cool in, in JavaScript. They, they tend to at least fix some of the issues because then you can do a little bit more, but it still is kind of a pain in the ass. Uh, ugh. Uh, what language isn't colored? So JS, Dart, C Sharp, Python have this problem. CoffeeScript and most other languages that compile to JavaScript do too, which is why Dart inherited it. I think even ClojureScript has an issue, though they've tried really hard to push against it in their core async stuff. Want to know which one doesn't? Java. I know, right? How often do you say, yeah, Java is the, uh, the one that really does it right? <laughs> but there you go. In their defense, they're actively trying to correct this oversight by moving futures in async I.O. It's like a race to the bottom. C Sharp also can avoid this problem, too. They've opted into having color. Uh, before they added async await and all their task T stuff, uh, you could just use regular sync APIs. Three more languages that don't have this problem, Go, Lua, and Ruby. Yeah. Uh, any guess what they have in common? Threads. And more precisely, multiple independent call stacks that can be switched between. It isn't strictly necessary for them to be operating system threads. Go routines, uh, Go routines and Go, coroutines and Lua, and fibers and Ruby are perfectly adequate. Yep. Yes. Yes. Go routines just make it super simple, right? You don't really have to think about anything. And I think that that is really nice. I actually really like this fact. And Go does have the problem, your functions that return channels. Well, no, channel, I, I don't think that's really a problem, right? A channel is just a concept that doesn't have anything to do with, with, with threading or coloring. I don't think they do, at least. I'd have to think about it, but I'm pretty sure threads or channels are just a little bit different. Maybe you're right. Waiting on a channel is coloring? No, because you don't have to call anything differently. That's the point, is that when a function is red or blue, there's specific syntax to calling that function that's different. So you have async await, or in Rust you have dot await, or in whatever other crazy language you have some other operator, right? Uh, you have, I'm sure there's one in Zig that I just don't even know about. But nonetheless, you have some special syntax you have to apply to the situation. A channel, though, you literally call it and return it, no differencing to your function, and it goes and it does its own thing and then comes back and you get the value back out, right? So it's like you don't have to do any sort of special syntaxing. They just have a lift operator that freezes your current thread until it's done, which I think is, that's, that's perfect, right? I think that's perfectly fine. I think that's perfectly and completely acceptable as... As it is. So, I don't think Go is color. I'm pretty sure Go is not a colored language. The remembrance of the operations of the past. The fundamental problem is how do you pick up where you left off when an operation completes? You've built something, let's see, you've built something up, let's see, oh my goodness, you've built up some big call stack and then you call some IO operation. For performance, that operation uses the operating system's underlying asynchronous API. You cannot, oh, wait for it to complete because you it won't you have to return all the way back to your language's event loop and give the os some time to spin before it will be done once operation completes you need to resume what you were doing the usual way a language remembers where it was is the call stack that tracks all the functions that are currently being invoked and where the instruction pointers is in each one yep but you, let's see so this is just basic explanation of an event loop so that's why you can't that's why in an, that's why you can't like you can't do a function with a callback and then do a while loop right afterwards, it will never get called. It's because you have to return control to the event loop before anything can even kick off or do anything because that's just, that's JavaScript. I love it. Uh, but to do async IO, you have to unwind and discard the entire C call stack. Uh, kind of a catch-22. You have to, let's see, you can do super fast IO. You just can't do anything with the result. Every language that has async IO in its core, or in this case, JS, the browser's event loop, copes with this in some way. Node, with its ever marching to the right callbacks, uh, stuff all those call frames in closures. Yep, that's all that happens. That's all that happens. Each of those uh, functions expressions uh, closes over the surrounding context. That moves the parameter like ice cream and caramel off the call stack and into the heap. Well, 
no, that's not true. That's when it comes to this. That's that's not whatever happens in JavaScript. Obviously, with JavaScript, it's always on the it's always in the heap. I mean, JavaScript is always heap, always heap. That's just all JavaScript does. Uh, all of the call stack into the heap. When the outer function returns, the call stack is trashed. It's cool. The data is still floating around the heap. Uh, the problem is that you have to manually reify every damn one of these steps. There's actually a name for this transformation. Continu continuation passing style. It was invented by a language hackers in the 70s as an intermediate representation to use in the internals of their compilers. It's a really bizarre way to represent code that happens to make some compiler optimizations easier to do. Oh, that's weird. Uh, no one ever thought for, let's see, no, no one ever for a second thought, uh, that a programmer would write actual code like that. And then node came along and all of a sudden here we are pretending to be a compiler backends. Where did we go wrong? <laughs> that's pretty, that's a pretty great statement. Uh, no, that promises and futures don't actually buy you anything either. If you use them, you know, you're still hand creating giant piles of function literals and you're passing them to the dot then instead of, uh, to the asynchronous function itself. Yes, this is true. You're, you're not, you're not buying anything here. Awaiting is generated solution. Async await does help. If you peel back the compiler skull and see what it's doing in there, uh, when it hits await, you can see that it's actually doing uh, the CPS transform. That's why you need to use await in C sharp. It's a clue to the compiler to say, break the function in half here. Everything after the await gets hoisted into a new function that the compiler synthesizes on your behalf. Yeah, this is why async await didn't need any runtime support in .NET framework. The compiler compiles it away in a series of chained closures that it actually uh, that it can already handle. Interestingly, closures themselves also don't need runtime support. They get compiled into anonymous classes. In C sharp, the closures are really poor man's objects. Huh. Okay, that's interesting that you didn't. Yeah, you didn't need a runtime for that. That's cool. That's cool that they had async await without a runtime. Okay. Okay. I didn't realize that. When I built a compiler myself back in the day for uh, Mini Pascal, we effectively did this. We could. There was no uh, because I built it for. Uh, uh, it was called IL back in the day. This was before LLVM. It was Microsoft's intermediate language. So it was like a language to represent all of its languages that, that it has to be compiled into this intermediate style that will then be compiled into the correct target. And so we had to build a compiler for IL. And IL didn't have closures. So what did we have to do? We had to generate a whole bunch of like these functions that you'd actually secretly pass a bunch of values to. Right? And so we had to like create a bunch of, a, it, was, it was fun. It was, it was a cool project. It really taught me a lot about some really weird things. You might be wondering, when am I going to bring up generators? Uh, does your language have a yield keyword? Then it can do something very similar. In fact, I believe generators and async await are isomorphic. I've got a bit of code floating around in some dark corner of my hard disk that implements a generator style game loop using only async await. I'm not sure if I think that's a good idea. Oh wait, where was I? All right. So with callbacks, promises, async await, and generators are ultimately end up taking your asynchronous functions and sparing it out into a bunch of closures that live over in the heap. Yeah, that's that's correct. Uh, your function passes the outermost one into the runtime, and when you, the event loop or IO operation is done, it invokes the function, and you have to pick it up where you left it off. But that means everything above you also has to return. You still have to unwind the whole stack. Yep, every single time. That's the only way to progress things forward. Uh, that's just how event loops work, dog. That's just how they work, dog. Uh, this is where the red function can only be called from red functions rule comes from. You have to a closure. You have to closureify the entire call stack all the way back to main or the event ha ha handler. I know. Do you, do you guys not know about this part? How many in chat, really? Like, how many in chat is this completely, like, novel concept to that have just never really thought about this? I think somebody literally just said observables for the win. Observables are literally this multiplied. Observables are just as red. New to me, really? Wow. Okay. I, I, I have no idea. Anyways, it is. It, observables are. They don't buy you anything. In fact, they just. They just buy you a more complicated version of this. Because now an observable isn't just a one-to-one -one operation. It's actually a one-to-many operation. That's like an entire new level of complication. Right? When you have to handle the idea that your function could execute more than once or your return value could be more than once, it's like a whole thing. It is an entire it's an entire thing. I enjoy piping. 
Go for it. I'm too tired for this. I'm going to get the milk. Okay, go go for it, buddy. All right. Uh, where are you? Okay, we are almost done here. Awesome. Okay, re a reified reified uh, call stacks. But if you have, let's see, but if you have threads, green or OS level, you don't need to do that. You can just uh, suspend the entire uh, thread and hop straight back to the OS or the event loop without having to return from all those functions. Yeah, so this is exactly, this is literally what I was saying. You could just always be blue and just have threads, right? That just works. Go is a language that does this most beautifully, in my opinion. As soon as you do any IO operation, it just parks the Go routine and resumes the other ones that aren't blocked on IO. I actually do think Go does this the best. Go, hands down, just does this the best. It, that's why Go, I think, is such a great language. I just wish it had just such a small amount of effort into Go, I think, could make it so good if we just had slightly, if we could just come up with a convention that makes it easy to return errors if they're errors, right? I know they're kind of working on it, and I know there's been discusses of it. Just do what Zig did, right? Try this function. If it returns an error for as the first argument or the last argument, however you want to define the convention, then get the hell out of there, return that error back up, right? Just don't make us write if error does not equal nil, right? That's it. Go. Everything else about Go is fantastic. I like its simplicity. Uh, I would love more generics. Obviously, I, I want to make Go more complex, all the time. I'm not sure if that's good though. I don't know if it's good. That's my one problem with Go is that I want all these things, but I'm not sure if I just recreate the mess I already have. Uh, if you look at the IO operations in the standard library, they seem synchronous. In other words, they just do the work and then return the result when they are done. But that's not. Uh, but it's not that they are synchronous in the sense that they would uh, that it would mean in JavaScript. Other Go code can run while one of these operations is pending. It's that Go has eliminated the distinction between synchronous and asynchronous code. Concurrency in Go is a facet of how you choose to model your program and not the colors uh, seared into each function in the standard library. This means all the pain of the five rules I've mentioned above is completely and totally eliminated. So the next time you start telling me uh, about some hot new language and how it's awesome, uh, or how awesome its concurrency story is because it has asynchronous APIs. Now you have to know why I started grinding my teeth because it means you're right back to red functions and blue ones. Yep. So Rust certainly has this problem. And I've definitely found this problem to be quite annoying in Rust. I actually find one thing that's even more annoying in Rust is that since futures are pull, if you don't add the dot await and you ignore, say, a warning, it like doesn't execute at all. And then you're like, dude, what, where, where am I? Why isn't this happening? Like that can be like, I don't like hot. I don't like hot promises or hot async code, but at the same time, I kind of like hot hotness, right? Uh, they're trying to solve the problem with keyword generics thing, which is in the proposal uh, with the crazy syntax. Yes, this, uh, I know. But is that any better? <laughs> I'm not sure if that's any better, right? Uh, are we reading in regards to colorless and zig functions in that article? I haven't, uh, I haven't, uh, done anything with, I, I don't know enough zig asynchronously to have, like, a strong opinion or even any opinions. Uh, are go routines running in parallel or just concurrently? They're both. They're parallel. You can run them parallel, par parallelly. Uh, they're just green threads, right? So it depends on your, like, operating system and, and, and the runtime. So if you have one core... You can't really run it in parallel, you know what I mean? But you can get parallel ex like so so here's a really simple test you can do to prove it. Just go create a map, go create a bunch of go threads and have them or go routines and have them uh effectively just just have them effectively uh just all read and write to the same map. You'll get a concurrent you'll get a, like a data race issue really quickly. All right? You'll get a data race super quick, which means they're parallel. They're not concurrent. Well, they're also, I mean, anything that's parallel, parallel. I mean, in a sense, is also concurrent. Uh, C Sharp is experimenting with green threads now. Good. Hey, I saw that. I saw that. Uh, red and blue functions, green threads. Oh, what's the alpha channel? I, nobody knows. Nobody knows what the alpha channel is, but we're going to discover it one day, and it's going to solve all of our problems and make programming beautiful again. The name is the green thread engine. <laughs> 